Bravo. Bravo. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Gossels, the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film, and it's my, well, first, thank you for sticking around for this conversation and Q&A with these wonderful filmmakers, Ron, Frank, and Glenn Kirschbaum. Bravo. Um, thank you for making this joy of a movie, this love poem to the late Gene Wilder. Thank you for bringing all the love and positivity into all of our lives, particularly now. This is just, we're so honored to be showing this on our opening night. Well, thank you for having us. You're a great audience. We've been doing this around the country and you guys really got it, so we really appreciate it. Right? Absolutely. And this is my third time seeing it, and as you know, there's nothing like seeing a film like this on a big screen. Um, I'm curious, actually, this is clearly many, a film working on many levels, and very nostalgic, I think, for many of us. And with a show of hands in this room, how many of you had seen some of the films excerpted in this movie? Awesome. Wow. That's our kind of crowd. <laughs> That's why the lot. And how many of you that haven't seen the films now want to see them? Okay. Um, so Ron and Glenn, I just want to say that um, this film was so beautiful. You obviously made a biopic about Gene Wilder, but you did something so much more profound and deep and moving. Uh, it was so revelatory, your movie, and I feel like we really got this understanding of this complex, beautiful man, full of authenticity and generosity and humanity and heart, you know, and, and not just as an actor, I think most of us didn't know that Gene was a writer and a director and a painter. And I love that we don't just get to know Gilda, the only person I knew, that we have the revelation of Karen Wilder. Um, of course, you had Mel Brooks as an anchoring interview. We'll get into all this more later. And also, I just marveled. I know you started as a, an editor, and we'll talk about that, but I was just really marveling at how you edited this film and the storytelling. I know you wrote and you edited, but just how poetic this film is and how you seamlessly wove together all these ideas. And it was just a joy to behold. You really gave us a home run, so I wanted to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Ron, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us about the genesis of this film, how you came to work with Julie and David and Glenn, and is this a departure from other work you've done in the past? Well, I've, I've done a couple of comedies in the past, but um, Glenn and I have worked over the years together on a lot of different television shows, uh, mostly for cable. Uh, and uh, they were, I guess, a lot of crime shows, <laughs> a lot different genre than this. Um, I met uh, Julie and her husband, David Knight, um, many years ago, and we've done a couple of projects together. Uh, this whole thing got conceived because the Nimoys were very close with the Wilders, and um, Karen wanted to do something, uh, make a statement about Alzheimer's. This. Uh, we didn't. We could have gone into much further depth about this, but uh, she, uh, this, this, what she was, what she went through, almost killed her, and uh, she wanted to talk about that. So we decided, getting involved, we said, well, there's a much bigger story here than just Alzheimer's, and we wanted to celebrate his career and his his life. So that's that's how this all came about. And, and we knew from the start, we, we wanted to make a love letter to Gene. We, we didn't want to dig up dirt, you know, let someone else make that movie. Um, this was someone that we loved. Uh, you know, anyone born when, when I was born in the late 50s, I mean, Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, there was nothing better. And, and so this was a real honor to get to work and meet people like Alan Alda and Mel Brooks and people we respect and, and love and that actually put some extra pressure on us because we knew they were going to be seeing this film <laughs> so it had better be good and uh, you know it, it was a joy to work on this film uh, Julie and David our executive producers truly let Ron and I make the film we wanted to make because this was being funded by pharmaceutical companies and, and Alzheimer's organizations, we didn't have any network executives blowing up 
our, pro our ideas. We, we got to make the film we wanted, and so if you like it, give us the credit. If you don't like it, you can blame us. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about all the, the people we got to meet in this film. If, if all of us had to make a list of people we'd like to sit in a room with, that's a pretty good list. And I'm curious about the order, who you filmed in which order, and about any surprise stories or even people that came out of the woodwork as they knew you were making the film that you'd want to talk about. The first, well, first interview was Karen. Um, that was done actually quite some time ago, and then COVID got in the way, so it prevented us from really doing uh, many other interviews, but I think it was when we interviewed Mel Brooks, which was probably the highlight for us. I mean, it was just an unbelievable interview. He goes on forever about, we could do the documentary just on the producers alone, the way he was talking. Um, it was, we knew we had gold because he just, he was so articulate, bright. He did this, he was 95 years old when he, uh, uh, he's 97 now, I think. Yeah. And, uh, he's, he, and he loves the film. He came, he uh, opened the film for our premiere in Los Angeles. Um, he tweeted about it, got like two million hits on, on his tweet. So uh, that really opened the door for us. And uh, then others wanted to come and participate. Harry Connick and, you know, what's Harry Connick doing in this? But he's exactly. a good friend. They actually yeah. composed a song together for uh, World's Greatest Lover. Um, Gene wrote music. We didn't, we didn't include that, but that was another one of his artistic skills. Um, and Carol Kane really uh, was very gracious to us to do an interview. She loved Gene very much, as Alan Alda did. And so it was just snowballed from there. I, I would say everyone that we interviewed really loved Gene. Uh, even, you know, Peter Ostrom, a little boy who played Charlie in Willy Wonka, he recognized how kind Gene was and, and just what a gentle man he was. Um, I think the last interview we did was Ben Mankiewicz and he benefited from the fact that he got to see a rough cut of the film so he knew where we needed to add some context, where Gene fit in in the pantheon of Hollywood greats. And so I you know, personally think that that adds a nice element that we, we see Gene in, in the context of the great movie comedians. And that was Ben Mankiewicz's contribution. I love that. Did you all like that? I just love that context. And I appreciated that you otherwise really work with people that collaborated with Gene that knew him. You weren't looking at present day actors or com comedic actors reflecting on Gene. These are people that knew and loved him. And, and that's, I think, your film has so much authenticity and heart like Gene because you did that. And, and that was our choice. Mm. You know, I, I think a lot of people, in order to get on television, you would make a film where you hear young comedians today talking about how influenced they were by the Gene Wilders. But we, we wanted to meet the people and speak to the people who knew him and loved him. And so that's what you're seeing. Um, I'll get ahead of ourselves here by saying we do have a theatrical release that will be coming up. Yay. Um, that's so great. you will be able to see this again Bravo. If, if you Bravo. want. I've seen it three times. I highly recommend a, another screening. And we're working on the television release. And so call all your local stations and let them know. Oh my gosh, I just had a question for you that went like that. Just say the last sentence before the theatrical. So call, I, okay. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, guys, I can't believe this. Um, it was something about, so, all right, well, I'm just gonna jump to another question. That'll come back. Um, Sorry. Let's talk about some of the, cho you had to make a lot of choices. Oh, this I remember. Gene Wilder. I was watching this film, you've never met Gene Wilder, which is astounding. And one thing, even I watching now, found to be miraculous. Gene was the guy that you used to edit the film, to write this film, to tell this story. And I know it was from an audio book and interviews, but talk about that, because it was so seamless, you almost forget, wait, Gene's actually telling us his story and you never met him. We could have gone after a Merv Griffin interview or something like that on television. Um, 
when we watched them, this was very authentic. Gene was telling us his story in first person. This is an audio book from Kiss Me From a Stranger, his autobiography that he published, I think, in 2005 or something like that. And so he was able to tell us his story. There's so much in, in that that we didn't put in. He talks about its shrink, and uh, he has therapy sessions out in the open. He's quite, you know, explicit. And we just, you know, Glenn is actually the one who sifted through the audiobook and picked out the, the gems. Uh, I think between the audiobook and the many interviews that Gene did on the Mike Douglas show, on the Merv Griffin show, we would hear stories that he would repeat over and over. The story about his mother being told, you know, don't upset your mother, you could kill her. I, we heard, what, four or five different versions of that story. So if this was something that meant a lot to Gene Wilder, we wanted to include that in the film. We also wanted to include our favorite scenes from Young Frankenstein, <laughs> from, you know, the what knockers. Uh, we, we, there were certain lines that we just knew we wanted <laughs> in this film. And the daisy, oh my God, those scenes were. And they still hold up. I mean, it's, this, these are films that are 50 years old that are still as funny as when they first came out. Um, is there anything you want to share about how you work together as a team and the, what were the challenges? You had so much material to work with. Uh, I, I love working with this guy. He's, he's, a bad, he's a native, too, here. He Boston. is a native. We need to really... Yeah. It, it, was a, it was a dream. It's like yin and yang. It's like Gene and Mel. I mean, we, not to compare, but we just had a great time. I, worked, I'm, I live in Connecticut. I used to live in L.A and work there, but I've moved to Connecticut, and he lives in LA, and we worked by coastal and it worked. We were on the phone every day. We were reviewing different scenes, different cuts, which we do, and uh, it worked beautifully. There were some things that we wanted in the film that went by the wayside. Uh, I think the fact that John Wayne was originally given the script to be the, the Waco kid in Blazing Saddles. Um, you tell this story better than uh, I he do. Said, he, 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 he said to Mel, Mel used to see him on the set in Warner Brothers, and he said, too dirty, I don't do dirty. So that's why he didn't do it. <laughs> he, also did, he also told us something else about Blazing Saddles. You know, he, he, Warner Brothers said, no farting. You can't have any farting. <laughs> and he said, you're right, you got it. No farting. <laughs> uh, this is bringing to mind the one scene I want to ask you about, and then we'll open up to our beloved audience to see what they have to ask you. But let's talk about Joseph E. Levine. It's one of my favorite stories. It's profound, it's deep, and it's great. So, uh, And it always gets a laugh. Uh, I think Ron picked up very early the fact that fate meant so much to Gene, that things are arbitrary, whether you take the left or you take the right around the, the fountain in New York can change your whole life. And the Joseph E. Levine story, the fact that the executive producer wanted to remove Gene Wilder from the producers after seeing the first set of dailies, that shows how close Gene came to not having a career. He could have just been eliminated, and who knows what, he, he might have just been, as he mentioned in the film, an obscure character actor. But Mel believed in him. Mel stood up for him. And as a result, we have these amazing films that you know, still hold up today. Um. I'm going to now open up for questions, and I just want to say, if y there's a question for one of you, you can feel free to repeat the question if it comes right to you, okay? So you don't need me to do that for you. Okay, who has questions for these talented filmmakers? In the back. All right, so the question and quick comment. Uh, was Alan Alda ever the film with Gene Wilder? I can't recall off the end. I just wanted to mention something that we know that Mike Pettiboy, who was featured in the film, was a child in Shanghai during World War II. Oh. 
Okay. I didn't know that. Did you you, I did hear that. Can you, you can, want to? Alan Alda? Uh, regarding Alan Alda, no, they did not appear in a movie together, but they were very close. I think they were Connecticut pals. Alan, I believe. Tennis buddies. Tennis buddies, that's right. Um, Alan would be, I remember, there was one line he, he in, in his interview, he said something like to the effect that he was worried about a movie that Alan had directed and Alan was worried how the audience would perceive it and he went to Gene for advice and Gene just looked at him and shouted and said, what difference would it make? And Alan just got relieved from that by Gene <laughs> telling him that. Uh, he, he would seek Gene's counsel. But that, that, they were close friends, but that was about it. And the, the interesting thing with the Alan Alda interview that you see in our film is it was done at the height of COVID and he did not want a camera crew anywhere near him. So that, f that interview was done on Alan's cell phone. And, wow. And through the magic of green screen, we created a room behind him. But, <laughs> but we, we faked it, so. That's wonderful. Yes, in the center. Was the relationship with Harrison Ford more limited than the others? Was it what? I'm sorry. Was, was his relationship can you repeat the question? Was his relationship with Harrison Ford more limited? Than the other yeah. actors? I, I don't know. I don't know what... We tried to get Harrison to appear in this. He turned us down. Um, I don't know what... I, I honestly, I don't know. He, he, he doesn't speak much about it in his book. So we don't really know. We could have asked Karen, I suppose. But uh, I think but, it was limited to that movie. But Harrison's mother, as you may know, is Jewish, and so he knows the, how Toches is pronounced. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So one of the more surprising things to me is that Willy Wonka was not a hit at the time. Every single person I know has seen that movie. <laughs> I, I can answer that in, in, in one word, DVD. <laughs> That's and the, the question? The, and the question oh, the, how, how, why was Willy Wonka, how come we know about the movie when it was a box office flop? And it was DVDs. My kids, I never saw Willy Wonka when it came out in the movie theater. I was probably the right age for it at the time. Uh, it disappeared. And I only knew about it because I bought a DVD from, for our kids. So I think it was because of that. But, but Gene, I think, realized he, he was very diplomatic, but I think he fully believed that his version of Willy Wonka was superior to Johnny Depp's. <laughs> um, he didn't like it. But interestingly enough, Ron just had a screening in Connecticut, and Halloween, a lot of the people, now adults, who showed up at the screening talked about the fact that they remembered when they were little kids trick-or-treating at Gene's house in Connecticut oh and he would invite them in and what a thrill to receive candy from Willy Wonka. So. That's amazing. <laughs> it's so hard to see with the lights. This one in the, oh, I'm glad with, you can... In, with the mask. Oh, I'll let yes. You. Okay. If you see... In, I think that Can you do the question. Too? The, the question is why we didn't put in more about Gilda and the phil philanthropic work. I think the answer is twofold. One, Love Gilda covered that in great detail, and, and we felt it, it, it's been done. Um, secondly, we knew that Alzheimer's was going to be receiving a great deal of attention. And we just didn't want to hit the audience with too much of a downer at the end of the film. You know, there were so many laughs here, and, and the material is so rich. And to then hit you over the head with Gilda and Richard Pryor's MS and Alzheimer's, I, I think it would have been a little much. We didn't even mention Gene's lymphoma, 
because he was in the hospital and almost died himself. Uh, we, we eliminated that as well. You know, you, you're given 90 minutes to tell the story, basically. And so, yeah, we, we've had people ask us, why not The Little Prince? You know, people have films that were their favorites that just didn't make the cut. Um, we tried our best, that's all I can say. Bravo, bravo. I literally can't see. There's a guy over there. Okay. okay. Were we in touch with the Silberman family? Yes. Uh, the only f uh, member was Rochelle, who is, is still with us. Um, she lives in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, she was Jean's, is Jean's cousin. Um, and I believe we had a, just had a screening in Milwaukee, which we don't know too much about, but a lot of his high school friends came out for that film screening, and they had a bit of a reunion in Milwaukee. Um, but uh, Rochelle was the closest family member, and her, her kids helped us out by giving us a lot of the old photographs of the family. There's a hand there. And I'm realizing that there's a light right there, so I can't, I'm going to yep. rely on you to, uh, to right, pick. Right there. There's yep. somebody there I see. Ah. What part of the film brought us the most joy? Well, for Love me, that. personally, I didn't want Gene Wilder to be lost to history. I, I wanted a, another generation to recognize his brilliance. So this film, part of the joy is that it's so nostalgic for people of our generation. And it's also wonderful for me that my son now, he's 16, he wants to see all of Gene Wilder's films and tell all of his friends about Gene Wilder. So if we can keep his memory alive and Mel Brooks's memory alive and these wonderful people for another generation, then for me that's the greatest joy. Do you have a joy? Uh, uh, I would say, <laughs> I, I don't know how I'll top that, but I would say that learning about Gene's character, I wish I had known him, but having, you know, I've developed a, a very close relationship with Karen Wilder. She's wonderful. We had a wonderful screening in Stamford, Gene's hometown, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And Karen's become a, a really good, good friend. I think learning about Gene's character, the kind of compassionate man that he was, he, you know, when you, when you had a conversation with him, you were the only one in the room, that kind of thing. I felt like we got to know him really, really well, and uh, I enjoyed that experience. Ron, I just want to say I love that you said that because I was thinking, you know, Karen talked about him really listening and then we hear about him reacting, like he, just the way he was as an actor but also as a collaborator. I think there are a lot of life lessons for us in them and this film and I was like about how to be a good human being, right? And, and good to other human beings and I was thinking as directors I wonder, like I picked up ideas in this film, you know, just seeing the joy that Mel Brooks got, right, from having the right group of people that he he was working with, knowing how to direct people and not control them, right? Like, I think there are a lot of lessons implicit in your film um, that are life lessons. The, the friendship between Mel and Jean was extraordinary. And, and for me, the heart, most heartbreaking moment in the film is when Mel talks about phoning and, and calling Jean while he was in the throes of Alzheimer's. and not being able to communicate and how heartbreaking and heart-wrenching that was. And our hope, again, with this film is that we can raise awareness about Alzheimer's. And I, and I think the Alzheimer's organizations realized that if you made a film about Alzheimer's, people won't necessarily want to go and see it. But if it's embedded in a comedy, in a film like this, a, a tribute to a gentleman like Gene Wilder, then maybe we can raise awareness, increase funding, and finally find a cure for this horrible disease. Yes, hi, sir. So.
You can do this one. I'm trying to remember from his, he, he does talk about this in his biography. I think Gene, the, the Gene part, I don't think it came from his It was mother. a relative. It was a family, it was yeah, an uncle. Because she spelt it with a J. And I don't think that, and Wilder, I believe came from Thornton Wilder. I, I think so, am I yes. right? Wow. Yes. Yeah, so that I, so uh, because maybe he was in our town, I don't remember, but I think that's where it came from. from but that, that was in a period where having a Jewish last name was not an asset. And, you know, I, I think we've made some progress where people don't change their names today. There were some moments where he talked about in interviews, he said, I can't see Macbeth, Jerome Silberman, you know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in the ring. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jean had, has a, an adopted daughter uh, from his second wife, I believe her name is Catherine. I think she's an actress in London. They had a big falling out uh, because of the divorce. Uh, but he officially had adopted her and she has the last name Wilder to this day, I believe. And by the way, I, I just on a personal note, want to say how happy I am that my 94-year-old mother is here in, enjoying this film. Yes. And, and, and it's great seeing so many of my friends from Sharon and from, from Camp Bowercrest. So thank you, everybody, for coming. A shout out to Roslyn High School over there <laughs> in Long Island. Yes. I love it. And help me if we're missing, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I then have to, just need a minute at the end of this. Does, are there, raise hands high and I'll let you guys There's look. questions, yes. Thank you, and thanks for coming. Uh, my, my quick question is, have you ever thought of making a movie about Mel Brooks? Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> we asked him. <laughs> and um, yeah, we thought about it, but I think he has other plans. No, we, uh, we didn't get very far with that, but we have enough material to tell a, a good long story about Mel Brooks, so maybe Julie, maybe that's our next movie, I don't know. <laughs> he, Julie! Yeah, Mel had said he would give us a half hour, and he ended up speaking an hour and a half, uh, pretty much that's until his, his doctor showed up. And, and, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, Ron did a film on the history of the Catskills, which maybe you folks will want we to see. We might have screened it here. And Some of you might, what was it called? It's called when, when Comedy Went to School. It's, it's available on PBS. If you do a search on PBS, you can see it, When Comedy Went to School. Anyone else? Can't see. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, right here. Over there. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Oh, and then there. I was going to ask the same question. You should do Bell Brooks next. Oh, okay. But um, how long did it take you to do this stuff with all the research and put together? Oh. Go ahead. I think it's a five-year project altogether to line up all the interviews and to, um, you know, the, like I said, the editing was easy because we didn't have 14 different people coming in and changing our work and making us, change, you know, take act three and make it act one and all of what we normally have to, to deal with. I mean, Ron and I spoke, as he said, every day and we would have a you know, it's like, okay, this week we're going to work on the Richard Pryor film. So we're going to work on, you know, depending on which interviews came in, that's how we decided what we were going to focus upon. And uh, it was fun. Okay, one last question. Right over there. for it. He, um, he actually studied with a rabbi, I, I think, um, to learn, to get the accent right. For Yiddish? And, yeah. And I, I, I guess he did learn Yiddish. 
um, what they said, he wasn't very religious. He, he was much more a spiritual guy. Gene was more Jewish. I mean, I think he was less Jewish and much more of a Francophile. He loved France and French wine. And I mean, he, he taught Mel. Mel told us. Mel graduated from Manischewitz to, to the best or better wine because of Gene. He didn't know about it before that. <laughs> But th this film did not start off as a film that we were going to bring to Jewish film festivals. It, it just evolved in that direction as we discovered, you know, Gene's grandfather, you know, being the president of a synagogue and the Frisco kid, you know, has the Jewish themes running throughout. and. Richard Pryor's daughter, Rain, who happens to be half Jewish, because Richard married a, a Jewish woman, uh, she talked about the importance of having an African-American man and a Jewish man, really one of the first interracial buddy films. And so in so many ways, Gene was uh, ahead of his time, and also a throwback to the earlier comedians. So. I think at the end of this film, we just were like, my God, what an amazing person. And, uh, you know. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ron and Glenn, for this extraordinary film and conversation. Um, before you leave, before you all leave, to our beloved community, I just wanted to say thank you for coming out for the opening night of the Boston Jewish Film Festival. We have 14 more in-person programs between now and November 12th, and we have a virtual festival that runs, we have six of our programs repeating online from the 13th to the 15th of this month. I want to highlight a few of our upcoming screenings that I highly recommend that we all in our organization recommend. Um, tomorrow evening at the Brattle Theater in Cambridge at 7 o'clock we have the 13th annual Fresh Flix short film competition, which is a celebration of the next generation of young Jewish filmmakers. That's, that's tomorrow night at 7. On Saturday night at 7 o'clock at the JCC, we have a wonderful documentary film about the unlikely heroine and trailblazer Chelly Wilson, and that film is called Queen of the Deuce at the JCC on Saturday night at 7. This weekend, we have the first of our two uh, double feature uh, MFA days, Sundays. Um, at 11 o'clock, we have a wonderful fiction film by French filmmaker Philippe Legay called The Man and the... Sorry, that was his first film. Called The Story of Annette Zellman based on a true story and a wonderful short film program called Moral Courage Shorts at 2.30. And then next Wednesday, we're going to be back in this beautiful theater for our centerpiece film, No Name Restaurant, which is a fiction film and it crosses cultures and religions and each of these programs have live programs and it, they should be wonderful so you can find all this information on our website bostonjfilm.org and and I just want to say that was thank quick. you. Anyway, sorry, I wanted you to know this. I want to say thank you to the Boston Jewish Film Festival for having us. And We're so happy to have you. Our whole staff is here, actually, and we have amazing volunteers, our technical director and projectionist we all love. Thank you all. Get home safe. Thanks for coming, everybody.